Tashi Delek, the 17th Tibetan parliament in exile, has recently started the Tibet advocacy in the Indian states, which aim to reach out to the state governors, speakers of state assemblies, chief ministers, union ministers, parliament members, and Tibet support groups. And this year, the Tibetan members of the parliament have also visited Indian schools and colleges and general public in four different groups in the states of Rajasthan, Gujarat, Odisha, Sikkim, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Jammu in Kashmir over the last month. The MPs who advocated Tibet in Jammu and Kashmir have concluded their advocacy on Tuesday this week in Leh, Ladakh. And I'm happy to have two of the MPs, uh, MP Yudhu Agutsa and MP Lopsan Siddhar, are joining us today for this conversation to tell us more about the outcome and impacts of Tibet advocacy in the Indian states. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Okay, just so to start with, uh, this question is uh, for both of you. Uh, the Tibet advocacy in Indian state is not new uh, since the uh, similar advocacy has been carried out, carried out in the uh, 16th TPIE. And this time it's not just uh, meeting the government legislatures and officials. Uh, the meeting is also focused more on the people and the younger generation in India. So uh, i like to ask, why was the need felt to reach out to the people of India now? Uh, Yudhana, you can go first. Um, thank you for having us. Um, under the advocacy visit of the 17th House of the Tibetan Parliament in Exile, my colleagues, Keshi Maram Thachila, myself, and Tashi Kundrubla, we were in the three states of West Bengal, um, Odisha, and Sikkim. And as you mentioned, this year, the I think uh, the highlight was really for us, not just the politicians, because in the past, in the 16th House, when we had the same, similar advocacy visit, we were focusing more on the uh, politicians, whether it is the members of parliament or members of the legislative assembly. Uh, but this time, I think for us, at least in our group, our main focus were uh, university students. And that being... I think we just had, just before that, we also had a, um, a advocacy a training in Delhi where we also discussed the need, you know, to broaden. I think in, uh, civil society and more particularly university students were very, very important. And as a result, what we did in our group was in West Bengal, we focused on Calcutta and Darjeeling. With Odisha, we went to Bhuvaneshwar, Katak and Puri. In, in Sikkim, we were in Gantok and Namchi. And the main agenda really was to uh, uh, kind of speak about why Tibet matters to India and bring in the shared heritage and shared future that we have as, as two civilizations, Tibetan civilization and the Indian civilization, where, where the Tibetan civilization has a lot of ancient ties with the Indian civilization. And then the situation inside Tibet and country, more importantly, one of the aspects was countering Chinese narrative with our own original Tibetan narrative. And one of the things that worked for us was, um, you know, we had, you know, uh, appeal from the speaker. We had, uh, this time we also had our um, materials in all the different languages. Like for us, we were in West Bengal, we were in Orissa and we were in Sikkim. So we had our materials in Nepali, in Bengali and in Uriya, which really helped us. People really took more interest in reading some of our materials. And then one of the things that I um, particularly felt important was to kind of emphasize on the historical independence of Tibet in, in, narrative, in countering Chinese narrative, you know. So we had uh, Sivan Shagapa's passport, which we had made into a brochure, his passport and his visas. So that was also uh, given a lot of attention by the university students particularly. So I think uh, in a nutshell, uh, the focus on university students was very important and it was, uh, I think it was very timely. So I think that's why we uh, we did that on university students. Yeah. Well, you like to add on that. Uh, why do you feel the need to reach uh, to, out to the young people in India right now? So uh, not to reiterate what you last said, but I think the important aspect of this uh, state advocacy as determined by the Tibetan parliament was the focus on universities and other groups at the same time, along with like the state legislator or like the politicians, right? So I think that was an important aspect of the advocacy. 
And uh, as part of our reach out, I think uh, uh, we weren't able to reach out to a lot of universities because I think uh, I think we also have to understand there are certain limitations, especially in South India, which uh, I'll probably talk about a bit more, especially when we come into the exactly the advocacy and what happened there. However, I think uh, for me personally, I think this was the first time that I uh, was participated in that. And as you mentioned earlier, was uh, it was a program that was started during the 16 parliamentarians. And I think it is an important aspect to continue this because uh, we do a lot of advocacy around the globe, world, like whether it's in the US, whether it's in Europe and other countries around the world. However, I think there is certainly a lacking of advocacy in India, which I think the 16 parliamentarians recognized and started this program. And it's something for us to keep continuing because uh, even though I think in northern part of India, where there is an Indo-Tibet border, people are much more aware of what Tibet and why Tibet matters. However, in the southern states, where there's not really a lot of historical connection with Tibet, uh, there's not much awareness, even though they, for me personally, I felt there was a changing attitude. People understood that there's something about Tibet that matters to India, and I think they understood that. However, it's still not something that is, uh, there's not a lot of historical connection with Tibet, especially in the southern states. So I think that is something that we really need to work more on. And I would also like to take this opportunity because I think for us to have uh, our advocacy was successful with Kumo Mingula and me was primarily due to the support of the chief representative office in Bangalore because there is not a lot of Tibet support groups, especially in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, and which we have to recognize. And, and I think there is a space for growth, especially with uh, the Tibet program that is at IIT Madras and there are other universities that are interested in that. So I think there is a space for growth. However, I also recognize that it's not as robust as some of the Northern India states where we do have a vibrant Tibet support groups. So I think that is something that I just wanted to share from my experience as part of the state advocacy. Okay, so let's can I, yeah. can I so Okay, sure, sure. You tell you can I uh, didn't uh, give you a broad uh, picture of the universities that we covered. I think it's important. So when we reached out to students as a primary focus, we were able to really uh, visit 10 universities, of which I think mainly about uh, six or seven of them were in Orissa itself. And in West Bengal, we covered uh, you know, four universities, Calcutta University, Bajbaj University, and New Alipur College. In Darjeeling, we did St. Joseph's College. In Orissa, it was largely thanks to, I think Lopsana was also mentioning, like some people make it happen for us. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible. In Orissa, it was the MP Sujit Kumar, who is the convener of all party Indian parliamentary uh, forum for Tibet. Without his support, we wouldn't have reached out to all these universities that we did. And uh, for us in West Bengal and Orissa, we didn't have, unfortunately, we didn't have any Tibet support groups, you know? So we, uh, there was only one in Kolkata. In Darjeeling, of course, there's a Tibetan settlement. So we got the support from the Tibetan Welfare Office. And in Sikkim, we had good support from the, the Tibetan Welfare Office, the settlement office. Other than that, in Orissa and Kolkata, we really had to work with, uh, you know, there was one supporter in Kolkata, Ruby Mukherjee. And in Orissa, we largely depended on MP Sujit Kumar, which is very useful. So we really covered about, uh, I think, in total, we reached out to more than 3,000 students this time, about 1,000 plus university students and 2,000 school children. So that was very, very good, you know, in terms of outreach to university students. Yeah. That's a good number of uh, students that you have reached out uh, this time in the advocacy in the North. Uh, so, Lopsanla, this question is for Lopsanla. Uh, so, um, you have visited uh, the southern state of uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu, and you have just mentioned that uh, the Tibet support group in these uh, two states is very limited, uh, small pockets of Tibetan uh, Indians who actually uh, support, uh, who has uh, idea about Tibet. And uh, also, uh, these two states uh, being near to the Karnataka state, which has the major Tibetan settlement uh, in India, uh, I'm sure the level of the awareness on Tibet, it's uh, different in uh, Karnataka, I'm sorry, in, in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So um, um, can you tell us, uh, was that uh, you have expected and is it different 
uh, like when you went and reached out to and meeting with the uh, government officials? So, uh, so, I mean, like, I can't really compare it to my, any previous uh, advocacy because this is my first time. So I don't really have a previous experience to compare this uh, visit. However, because I was traveling with Kumo Mingyula, who was actually part of the 16th Tibetan Parliament in exile, and as well as uh, participated in the state advocacy during that time, also in these two states. So I think what was interesting from his perspective was things are, uh, there is more knowledge about Tibet, which I felt was uh, very encouraging. So for example, when we were in Kerala, like we had the opportunity to meet the CM, just so I don't get the names wrong, the CM Pinarayi Vijayan, as well as the speaker in Shamsil at their, at their offices. And the welcome and the conversations that we had were very positive in terms of just having a conversation about why Tibet matters, why they understood it and how they, uh, uh, in some ways, support uh, our kind of like appeal. We were able to give them the appeal letters. So there was uh, a general understanding of that, as well as, uh, for example, with uh, Kerala, where we were hosted by the governor, uh, Shri Arif Mohammed Khan, for a formal dinner. And I think these were kind of like, it's not us individuals that were being given the respect. It's like the Tibetan parliament in exile. It's the Tibetan, uh, central Tibetan administration, which was being respected by these uh, state leaders, which I I thought was great. And, and from my colleague's perspective, it was a change. It was something much more positive. Uh, in terms of Tamil Nadu, uh, it was uh, not as similar, like because we were able to meet uh, different state leaders, like from the BJP to the Congress, and there was a really warm welcome and they had a really good understanding of Tibet and they assured us in terms of like being able to talk to their senior leaders and the leaders at the center to raise the issues that we were talking about, whether it's about, uh, as Yula mentioned earlier, where we were talking about why Tibet matters for India. And we also raised the issues of the succession of his holiness and uh, and what the U.S. government has done in terms of legislation and how it is important for India to actually make a stand. So there are certain things that we were able to raise that they understood. So I think these were some of the things. However, as you said, uh, Chennai or Tamil Nadu, which used to have a vibrant Tibetan uh, student association, right? And me being a formerly from Chennai itself, where we had, I think when we were in Tibetan Student Association of Madras, we had more than 100 students. So there was this association, everything. However, it's not there. And it's nothing to do with uh, whether they were getting admission or not. However, the fact remains, there were not a lot of students there. I think there were only about one or two Tibetan students in the whole of Chennai. So I think that actually does reduce some of the impact because while there were students and there was a community there, there's more uh, awareness campaigns, there's more conversations around Tibet, which is hard to do, especially when you don't have Tibetans there. And... And I think with regards to Tibet supporters, I think I think it is the responsibility of the parliamentarians like us and others before us and others that will follow us to build more contacts in those areas. And a really good thing that the parliament did, like the Tibetan parliament did right now, is having a lot of those materials available in those languages, which was really appreciated. So for example, like the flyers, which were available in the Tamil, and uh, Malayalam was highly appreciated by all the politicians, by all, everyone that we met, because they felt that, oh, they can read it and it was given respect. So I think it's also important to understand where in the Southern states, there is a lot of cultural affinity. There's a lot of like, uh, kind of like uh, pride in their own language. And this allowed us to reciprocate that, right? And to share that. So I think that was great. And in terms of universities, right, I think we had a really good conversation at the IIT Madras where they actually have uh, introduction to contemporary Tibet as part of their studies, which I thought was probably one of the most important things that they've been, uh, most of, one of the most important things because the reason is, it's part of the China studies program. However, without understanding Tibet, you cannot understand China. And so this is something that uh, uh, Professor Sunita at IIT, she gets that. And she is someone that I think is pioneering that in the sense like when you want to understand China, whether it's China studies or Southeast Asian studies or East Asian studies, you have to understand Tibet. And so that is where I think that kind of like program in such a university, esteemed university and others, if it can be followed, would be really beneficial to the Tibetan movement because that will allow the next generation of Indians to understand why Tibet matters for India. 
And yeah, so I think in a nutshell, I think these were, it was a really good experience in some ways. Uh, it also kind of made me think about the amount of work that we still have to do. And it's not about saying like what could have been done or what others shouldn't, have, what others hadn't done before. It's more about like, okay, this is what the reality is. And there are some really good positives. However, there are also steps that we need to take forward, right? So I think it's about like what the next steps look like. Okay, and uh, thank you. So this next question is for Yudinla. So uh, Yudinla, you have visited uh, the West Bengal, Sikkim and Odisha along with your uh, colleague, uh, MP Keshik Milam Tajinla and MP Tajitintula. So um, I'd like to ask, uh, how was the response from the uh, these uh, three states, especially uh, from the Sikkim government, since uh, historically we share uh, a similar, uh, cult some similar culture and ways of living uh, with Sikkim. And you have also uh, been there, but, uh, also visited other places like Kalimpo and Darjeeling as well, right? So um, how were... Yeah, Darjeeling. So uh, can you tell us more about that and uh, uh, what were the responses to it when you went and met, met with the government officials of these states? Yeah, so um, some of the highlights, I think I've already talked a lot about the university, so I will not repeat that. Uh, we also met with civil society groups, with think tanks and thought leaders. In, in Kolkata, we were at Ramakrishna Mission, where we organized a one-day seminar with the help of uh, NGO Ghana Shamane Kolkata and Soho Bharat Foundation. And in Orissa, we had the first day only we had this uh, meeting, which was held uh, through uh, MP Sujit Kumar, but through this NGO called Center for Youth and Social Development, which also had a number of scholars and uh, think tank members. And so there was a very good interaction in that. And in Orissa, we also met, which was another um, another thing that we uh, thought was uh, quite different from what we had been doing before. Uh, we met with the Jagat Guru Shankaracharya of Puri. He is one of the four the main Hindu, uh, you know, kind of sub, sub Jagat Guru, you know, kind of highest uh, Lama. So that was, I think, uh, very, um, for us, for the first time, it was quite interesting to meet with him and tell him about, I mean, from uh, kind of update him on what's happening inside Tibet and uh, getting his blessing. It was merely to receive his blessing. And uh, the usual uh, meeting with politicians and government officials also happened. We made sure that we met with um, cross-party members, not with you know one party or you know the ruling party, but with opposition leaders, party party leaders, uh, with MPs, with MLAs, and uh, we also met some senior bureaucrats in many states. Uh, unfortunately, in Kolkata and Orissa, we were not able to meet with the CM and governor. Uh, in Orissa, we had an appointment with the governor, but last minute uh, there was this letter saying that we need clearance from the MEA, and it was it wasn't possible. So uh, so that was the case in Orissa, and uh, but we met with some senior bureaucrats. Some of them not officially, but through help of friends. Again, we also used a network of friends from college and stuff like that. So we met uh, in Kolkata. We met some additional chief secretaries in private meeting at a reception. And we also met with the U.S. Uh, Council, Council General. It was in Sikkim. I think Sikkim was different because in Sikkim, uh, we had really the maximum number of uh, politicians, even at the highest level. You know, the first day of our uh, visit there, when we got in there, we met with the um, governor, Lakshman Acharyaji, Honorable Lakshman Acharyaji, who already had a lot of knowledge on Tibet. And he was very forthcoming and attentively listened to all our uh, issues that we were raising. And then uh, we also met with the speaker, the deputy speaker, the forest minister, additional chief secretary. And then at the end, we also met with the CM, uh, the CM, uh, Honorable Prem Singh uh, Goleji, Tamang Goleji. And uh, with the CM, um, uh, one thing that was very nice was that uh, unlike, unlike before, when we did meet him, in Sikkim, we always had a lot of... Uh, uh, what do you call it? It was easier. It's, it was always easier to meet politicians in Sikkim, but with the CM, sometimes it's difficult. But this time the CM gave us a nice, an hour and a half meeting where he hosted dinner for us and also listened to all our um, concerns that we had. And in our uh, kind of uh, kind of time with him, we not only talked about things, uh, you know, issue and critical situation inside Tibet, 
but also raised through uh, with the help of the uh, Tibetan settlement officer also, we uh, brought in concerns that our uh, Ravangla settlement people had in terms of their uh, land registration, in terms of the refugee uh, certificate uh, registration and all that. So there he gave a very good uh, kind of hearing and he said he definitely promised to look into it. And um, what was also suggested was that he would appoint a PRO, a public relations officer, that would be a direct link between uh, between his government and the Tibet, between the Tibetans. So that was something that he uh, told us. And um, he was also suggesting a seminar on like, you know, common ties, cultural ties uh, between uh, uh, people of the Himalayan region. And he was saying that he's also interested in participating. He also suggested uh, the CM of Arunachal should be invited and other Himalayan region from Ladakh and maybe Himachal Pradesh also for that matter. So those were some of the suggestions he gave. And uh, and then I think we also uh, approached him on, because we had a talk at the Namgyal Institute of Technology, uh, Tibetology, sorry, in, in Sikkim. And there the Soarikpa students had concerns about career concerns. So CM also announced his plan to have this um, AMGs, the Tibetan doctors, in few select government hospitals. So that was something he came up with. And uh, besides Sikkim, uh, some of the other uh, states where we had um, uh, Ram the Rama Devi Women's College in Orissa, they were quite interested in doing some sort of a cultural exchange program to visit Dharamsala. And there was this uh, Ravenshaw College uh, University who were interested in actually looking at uh, curriculum on in the Department of Philosophy. They wanted to look at the C learning curriculum and see if they can uh, work on, uh, you know, kind of incorporating some aspects of that into their Buddhist uh, philosophy and uh, into their curriculum. That was, uh, I think, some, uh, I guess, uh, impact of the of the visit, some tangible impact, I think. And besides that, um, Yutunla, were you able to meet any uh, media in the respective states? Were you able to address any media? In Kolkata, where we found uh, most challenging in meeting uh, politicians, and even with, uh, we were at Kolkata University and uh, two other universities in Kolkata, New Alipur New College. But there, what happened was, while we were in talk with the political science department to have our uh, seminar, last minute there was this kind of, a, a, you know, a change and we were kind of, you know, shifted to the Buddhist studies department. So, and then even meeting politicians were a little bit of a challenge. So because of all those challenges, we felt the need to have a press conference in Kolkata and which we did. And I think Kolkata was the only place where we um, kind of proactively organized a press conference. And the, the, the response was pretty good. We had a lot of press, Telegraph covered us um, and local, most of the local press covered us. So that was quite good. In other places, we didn't need to do a press conference because we were very, very um, uh, busy with all the colleges and everything. So um, there we also had the press covering our programs without having to kind of do a press conference. So we didn't do it. Only in Kolkata, we did a press conference, yeah. Okay, and uh, the next question is for Lopsanla. So Lopsanla, um, can you also tell us what are the lessons learned for the future advocacy uh, from the state? In terms of like preparation, right, I think one thing that I was doing personally was I was trying to figure out what the context was in a lot of these states. So, for example, if you're in Tamil Nadu, like, so, for example, as Yudna said, trying to meet across the wide spectrum of the political uh, uh, ecosystem, right, not just with one leadership or one political party, uh, that was part of it. At the same time, you also try to understand where those people are coming from, like, so do some research on the individuals and what they might be interested in. And it's not, sometimes you find points of convergence, sometimes you don't. However, I think when you're trying to have, you're trying to do some advocacy, it's not about saying, can you help us with this? Can you do this? It's also a conversation. It's about making an impact, right? So to do that, you also have to understand where these leaders are coming from. What are their concerns? What are the concerns of the state? So for example, like one thing was like, when I, when I talk about, education, when I talk about the colonial boarding schools inside Tibet, I talk about Tibetan identity, Tibetan language, which is so important if you're thinking about Tamils, 
Tamil Nadu, like the language is such an integral part of their culture, even in Malayalam, like in Kerala. So these are things that they can connect on. So you have to connect to individuals as human beings. It's not about like, uh, this is the issue of Tibet. Can you support this? It's about trying to figure a way to just make human connections and also understand their concerns and try to figure out how can you raise issues that are important to you that also align with their principles. So I think there are certain things that requires a lot more research and trying to understand the ecosystem as, as well. So I think these are part of it. And in terms of, I think I just wanted to add earlier when Yudala was talking about the media and all of that, uh, especially in South India, like where we weren't really able to get a lot of press coverage. However, what was interesting was a lot of these senior leaders and politicians, right, started sharing our meetings on their own social media, which was very interesting. So in a sense, like it was a meeting, which I think sometimes like when you meet a political leader in India, right, they will do that for the sake of doing it. However, sharing it on their own social media, on their like, on their, what do you call it? Like uh, party website or party social media. That was different because that actually shows that we are taking this as an important aspect and we are showing it to our own community. So it's not only about that meeting, it's also about telling their own community these people are Tibetan. They are here raising certain issues. They are raising the issues about Tibet. And this is something that they are meeting, right? And they're sharing that. So I think that was important to address and to share so that like you could see that the interest as well as the relevance of Tibet to the Indian masses is there. And this is completely different, right? But one thing I just wanted to share was uh, in Tamil Nadu, when I was in Chennai, so I was just looking up for restaurants. And one thing that was so interesting was there was a Tibet Momo chain. I think there was like eight or nine Tibet Momo chains and it was completely owned by an Indian. Nothing to do with Tibet, but it was called Tibet Momo. And I mean, like the, I saw certain issues with the, the logo and stuff like that, but that's beside the point. However, you could see in a place like Chennai where there's not a lot of Tibets, but Tibet Momo is a chain and it was built in the last few years and it already has a, a number of chains, like maybe more than eight chains in Chennai and it's growing. So you can see that there is an interest in understanding Tibet from the common Indians. And when you go around Chennai, where, as we, as you said earlier, like there's not a lot of Tibetans, but you'll see a Tibetan uh, prayer flag, rain horse, lungta everywhere. So I think there is a certainly an interest, but the question is, how do we move that interest into the political sphere? How do you move that into something that is advocates for Tibet? I think that is the challenge, but that is also the opportunity, right? So I think there is a lot of opportunity there about moving that. Okay, and uh, Yudinla, uh, can you also tell us uh, what are the uh, takeaway from your uh, visit advocacy in these uh, states and what are the lessons learned for future advocacy? Yeah, I actually want to resonate what Lopsala was just saying. I think uh, when you go for advocacy, you know, advocacy visit and you meet with uh, uh, a group of people or politicians or civil society members or thought leaders, it's not just about downloading your information to them, you know. It's not just about telling them, every, like, you know, just for, for 20, 30 minutes about all about Tibet and, you know, not letting them kind of, not listening to, the, to them, I think is not right. I think uh, it's very important to listen to them as well and try to also understand their uh, situation and their concerns. I think that's how we would build. Uh, I think advocacy is all about building relationships. And I think there is a great scope for that for us, for garnering more deeper and meaningful engagement uh, amongst the Indians. But we need to be very consistent and continued in our in this process of building relationships, you know, which I think there is at the moment uh, when we were in uh, Kolkata and Orissa, Sikkim is a different story where Sikkim is everything is good. We can still do more, of course. But in Kolkata and Orissa, I just felt that uh, we had no reach when we were there. I did use, uh, you know, my own personal friends, connection and college and, you know, alumni and stuff like that also, that also helped. But I think we could do more in the future. I think we can have uh, more Tibet support groups, maybe in uh, a place like Kolkata and Bhuvaneshwar is really fertile for like a Tibet culture center, you know, maybe we should have like, I think it's also in the vision of His Holiness that we should have many culture centers in, in the major cities of India. So I think 
if not everywhere, Kolkata definitely needs one because Kolkata is, when we went there, I found it so, uh, such rough political terrain, you know, because there was so much going on. The TMC was totally kind of scattered in trying to, for the next election, you know, there was so much clamor and everything. There's so much uh, election and electoral politics happening that we found that there was this uh, vacuum, you know, in terms of Tibetan support and all that. So I think Kolkata would be a great place for a Tibet culture center. And we and through that, we could build more connection, uh, deeper relationships. I think uh, we should do that. So there is this, I felt that people were very concerned about Tibet when we reached, when we reached out to them. But there was a general lack of awareness, even among uh, not just students, but even, even among politicians, even MLAs, many MLAs, some of them, uh, one few of them assumed that we were coming from Tibet, and then we had to explain to them, no, 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 we are from Dharamsala. So then, oh, like they're like, oh, oh, yeah, we know, we know. Like sometimes they just kind of space out, and so oh, yeah, we know, we know that you know there is a government in exile and all that. So all that needs like consistent and continued engagement. I think which we need to work on. It's from our side also because we cannot blame others for support when we are not doing. Uh, I think we are doing, but we could do more. There's a room for improvement, you know. And I, I felt that uh, in our presentation, we did a mix of just talking and PowerPoint presentations because we had PowerPoint presentation on environmental destruction and stuff like that. But I thought short capsules, you know, video capsules of two minutes would be better on a particular issue. It shouldn't be all over, uh, all, all issues in one, two minutes, but two minutes of a particular issue. Maybe political issue, two minutes, video capsule. Uh, environmental issue, two minutes. Uh, women in Tibet or whatever, two minutes. Like a particular issue and a video capsule of two minutes. I think that would be very useful because sometimes people are, uh, you are catering to all kinds of people. Some want it visually, some want it more in PowerPoint, some want it just, you know, spoken. So I think we need to use those tools. I think it's very important. And um, what I thought was, um, in our own, uh, I think in our uh, communication, we need to be much more faster also, you know, we in responding. Uh, I think in Kolkata, I mean, most challenging for me was Kolkata in the three places, in the three states that we went, West Bengal and more specifically Kolkata. Darjeeling was fine because we had our settlement office there and all that. Uh, in Kolkata, what I felt was we didn't have a support group. There was one identified at the last minute and she also did her best, and uh, but she felt that uh, she could have been approached much sooner. So in 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 transmitting the messages, also even within our own CTA and TPIE office, I think we are a little bit slow in that. So we need to be faster in this age of fast technology and all. I think we need to be uh, much more faster than in responding. I think that would also help because she was saying one of the factors. There were numerous factors. But one of the factors was that uh, if she had more time, she could have done better. You know, so she was only there was only one person there, support group. So I think that was one reason. And um, yeah, I think Itko, Itko tried to help us in Kolkata, uh, but Itko I think is challenged with very little staff. So India Tibet Coordination Office needs more staff, more staff, and perhaps one dedicated just to focus on parliamentary outreach and advocacy, you know, I think that would be good because you cannot have, you cannot assign a staff who's already burdened with so many other things to do this, that, and everything. So you need one person just focusing on this work so that he or she takes time throughout the year in building that relationship. Because everything really just boils down to this connection and network and relationship, you know. And you cannot have last minute appointments by calling somebody and saying, we want to meet you. So I think that I think is also needed, you know. So those were some of the lessons I think that I, learnings that I had from this uh, advocacy visit. Uh, but no, I'll just add one thing. I just want to add one thing was, I think when I was, when we were like, Go Mila and me, we, when we were in Chennai and, uh, and Kerala, right? So we did, uh, had a visit to the Loyola College and I met a friend of mine who's a professor in Kerala. So it was like, I, the reason why I'm mentioning this is like, we didn't, we weren't able to do any events. However, it was laying the groundwork for future events. 
So I think this is also important, like in terms of like when you're doing advocacy, it's not only really about this time, it's also about what you can do in the future. And as part of that, I think that one of one important thing is the institutional memory, right? Who retains that memory? So I think like if it's South India, like maybe it's a CRO office, uh, like maybe as uh, Yulla mentioned, like if there's somebody at ITCO that is primarily responsible for maintaining a lot of the parliamentary relationships, there is that memory that is uh, harnessed and is continuously updated, right? So it's not like the moment we are doing a new advocacy, we are like, okay, let's try to find new people. Who do we reach out to? We already know people that are uh, part of those uh, areas, as well as like who have the connections, who have the reach, who we can talk to, like even before the advocacy begins, even before we have a preliminary, like, okay, this is the dates that we are traveling. No, you can just have conversations with them, right? So for example, Yudla uh, was assigned these different states. I was assigned different states. We knew about the states way back. However, like the planning is always going to be a bit closer, right? However, if you already had all these connections, you can always have start a conversation like few months ahead of time. So, but to do that, you need a lot of the institutional memory. You also need to have all these set up. So I think that requires, I'm not saying that it's not our responsibility alone, but also through the ITCO or like the Tibetan Parliament or like the different settlement offices. And to do that, I think one thing is the institutional memory. It is not about the individuals, it's about the institution, right? So we really have to think about how does those institutional memories remain in the institution without thinking about the individuals who have those memories. Okay, so yeah, I, I, um, I agree with Lofsanla. I think we need to really, uh, after when we have an event, uh, whether it is the World Parliamentary Convention on Tibet or whether it's the advocacy visit, we must keep the institutional memory. We must have follow ups, you know. So, and the follow up can happen not just from our end, but through the various other bodies, you know, whether it's the uh, the representative's office, whether it's the uh, settlement office, whether it is the ITCO. So I think there we need to share all those uh, learnings and uh, work to kind of build up on that, you know, in the, for the future, the way forward. I think it's it's very important. And uh, like uh, Lofsana said, even as parliamentarians, we need to plan ahead. And when we have an advocacy visit, in our case, we tried that, you know, we had something, a draft, like a plan in June. We sent it in June. We went in August, two months ahead. But uh, at the at those places, the lady was saying in Kolkata that she got nothing till the end of July, you know, about us. So there also is some slack, right? So I think in the future, those should be avoided. You know, as in the age of uh, fast-paced technology, we need to be, I don't know, sometimes we are, as people, not so quick to respond. I think that there again, the response rate also needs to be a little bit better. And then maybe we can have uh, maybe more, you know, there's always room for improvement. You know, in the future, we can be much more organized, much more uh, maybe a deeper engagement with students and uh, maybe a one or two culture centers, you know, which can also act as a hub for, for more uh, such advocacy work. I think it's important. So yeah. prior plan. Add, uh, add, on, on the, on the, so, but like when you like you're talking about like cultural centers, right? One thing, uh, like I want just wanted to focus on was, we have the Tibetan medical Minsikans, right? We have a Minsikang in Chennai, we have a Minsikang in Kochi, and these things can be centers. And I think we haven't realized the potentials of these uh, centers because the Tibetan medicine is something that helps so many Indians, right? However, in, in the political space, how that is being implemented or utilized, I think there's a lot of space there. I just want to end on that. So yeah, so why don't we, I think uh, I think people on, on all sides, we need to think a little more, uh, what do you call it, cross, yeah. cross fertilize a little bit, you know, instead of uh, working in small compartments, we need to do things. If you are the only Tibetan entity in a city, then maybe you should take on more than what you're doing, you know? I think that's important also, I think, yeah. Lopsala and Yutula, so these are my questions for today and it was wonderful talking to both of you and uh, this conversation has been very insightful and um, thank you so much for giving us your time today and uh, wish you all the best for the upcoming parliament session coming on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
With this, we have come to the end of today's In Conversation with Tibet TV. We have discussed on the outcome and impacts of the Tibet advocacy in the Indian states, recently covered by the members of the 17 Tibetan parliament in exile. Thank you all for watching and see you in the next episode.